Okay, so um, I actually got it working fully. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised myself uh, exactly a week later. So a week ago, I decided I would do this little project to build this little uh, sort of, you know, virtual computer, virtual machine thing, right? To come up with an instruction set, implement a virtual machine and, um, and a little assembler for it and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I just finished with the assembler today, at least for for a simple sort of instruction set. Um, let's see right now. So this is, uh, let's have a look at it. So I didn't get around to making this program read a file from disk, but that's just a couple of lines. I just decided that, um, you know, it's it's been sort of a long day. I've, I've done some, I've had some other stuff I had to do today and then spent a couple of hours on this and I got kind of late. Anyhow, um, you can just imagine this is read from a file, you know? So from this point on, um, the, uh, the assembler has a parser, right? And then it has now a code generator. Uh, I ended up with quite a lot of code. It's not, I, I guess it's not too crazy for being sort of like a, a parser and, um, a compiler or like a full compiler, but anyhow, could use some nice little little tricks like here. This is the this is the code generation for uh, for generating an upcode. So the uh, let's just review the stages first. So there are three stages to uh, the assembler. The first one is so this is the entry point. The first stage is that we parse the uh, assembly kind of program, like we parse this text, right? And if any errors occur, we kind of report that. There's also a new reporting structure. It reports sort of like a little piece of information here to to the caller that you can print and, and has you know source line information and stuff like that. Anyhow, so the first stage is to is to parse this. And we looked at that in the previous parts. Um, and the output from that is I just call it a module right now. Let's see where's the parse function. Um, so it's called a module right now. It's, it's really just a list of all the functions that were present in the source text. So it just keeps like parsing functions until the end of the source text and that returns that list of functions. The next stage is, uh, analysis. I stubbed this out. I actually didn't end up doing it, needing this. Uh, instead I integrated that into the code generator since that needs to do some checks anyways. And the code generator needs to be aware of things like for this operation, what exactly are the acceptable arguments, right? It needs to, it also needs to understand if, if, uh, you know, here we have two move operations, move instructions, right? And the first one takes the form of two register operands. And the second one takes the form of a register operand and an immediate operand. So, you know, it has to, it has to have that sort of knowledge, um, so why not just do the analysis in one place? It's kept this around uh, since I might play around with this next week, but we'll see. And the final stage is code generation. This is where I spend most of the time kind of yesterday and today. It's pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go into much detail how it works today. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that in the next video. Um, but for code generation, we're essentially first setting up some state that we just need for code generation. Uh, there's a, all of these things is an abstract at the top, kind of has some better documentation of these short names, but essentially we allocate some space for the instructions that we'll be producing and then some, uh, some state for the, the function, like a table of all the functions that we've, that we've created. And then we have two arrays for or tables for labels. We have one for defined labels and we have one for labels yet to be defined or undefined labels. And then it's pretty straightforward from this point. We use loop through, so we get the module here. So we just loop through that module, which contains functions, one function after another. And then so we then we call the gen fun, gen function cogen thingy. <laughs> it's making up a better name. Um, and this one doesn't really, it doesn't do anything with parameters and results right now, since there are no locals support, but in the future, you know, you would produce Kind of locals and allocate registers based on these things. Uh, if the function doesn't have a body, it just does nothing, since you know a 
a function without a body in our virtual machine code would really not mean anything. If we would have to, if we wanted to support that, we would have to insert a return instruction. Otherwise, you know, you would just fall into the next function. Um, and the next thing it does is just to uh, save the, the offset to the function and then it goes and then does the same thing we did here. It goes through each block of the function for each block where um, first recording the, uh, the, the blocks position, sort of logically speaking, like the label will record at uh, its, its offset. And that's how we can then later do things like referring to stuff by name, right? So that if we look at this code again, like we, we see here that we'll, we're going to branch to the label end, right? So we can just name this label. We can just call it anything. Um, and then here we'll, uh, we have a, another label, right? And another label and we name that here and so on. So we can use names for labels. So labels has a certain offset into our, our like program. Um, and then what we do here, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but essentially you'll have um, you'll you'll have this sort of like a chicken and egg problem right with with labels with this kind of assembly so at this point right um, we define label b1 and down here we're referencing it so straightforward right we define it and then later we reference it we just know that that's at instruction four I guess right however, it gets tricky when you reference a label before it's been defined, right? So we reference the end label. At this point, we haven't gotten here yet, right? So we don't really know what the offset is. So what we have to do is to stuff that into a table and later when we define this, we'll go back and we patch this, this up with an actual distance or, or, or value for the label. So that's what this thing does or part of it. This does the, the latter part. And then, you know, again, we just go through each of the instructions of the uh, of the block. And remember from our little uh, syntax, which is can be found in the readme file here, a block contains a, uh, a list of statements and a statement, it's either a operation, assignment or a binary op. And this, I'm not gonna talk about this now, but the syntax supports this, the, uh, there is then a, an AST transformer that just folds this into an operation. Um, and so that the code gen never actually sees this. So the code gen just has to deal with these two things. Um, and so it does that, it switches on the type. And if it, if it gets something else from the AST, it'll be, you know, it'll be complaining and pointing it out in the source code for you. If it gets an assign, uh, an assignment, so an assignment is really just, you know, something that looks like um, x equals y, right? Or it might, actually, we have two examples here. So it either looks like this, a equals an operation and some arguments possibly. And the other form is just like um, a equals b. And the requirements here are a little different. Um, and so th what this function does, it really it just transforms the ASD from a equals op bc to op abc. And in this case, it just um, transforms it to a move operations. That's essentially what this is. And then it just calls our gen op function. So really there's just, there, there really is one function in a way. There's really just one substantial function to the code generation, which is kind of elegant. Um, so there's not a code path to here, right? So if you get, get an operation straight on. Um, and this is the meat of the the code code generator. And what it does here is that you know it gets the this node represents the uh, the operation that is gonna generate an instruction for. It looks the first thing we need to do is to look at the instruction encoding for that operation. And so we've defined that in our uh, in our ISA little instruction um, definition here, right? So we have uh, a a name. Right, a, a name that we use internally in the in the you know uh, in our C code here. Then we have an uh, arguments that is sort of like the uh, the instruction encoding or the argument encoding for that particular operation. Um, and then we have just an F, the name that's actually used in the syntax. 
uh, right now they I think that they are just exactly matching the lowercase but you know that allows us to have like weird things like you know if we wanted to have parentheses around it or I don't know like um, something that's not a valid you know um, uh, C identifier and then there's just comments about the semantics for it right so anyhow this is the key here uh, so what we need to do is to map the operation type to its its arguments, right, in the in the code generator. I make a change here. Oh, I did. So let's just undo that. So do that in uh, uh, with just a switch. So generate a switch that has a case for each operation, right, and then just issue a go to so this is essentially just a, a table that's what the compiler is going to generate for us like a, uh, an indirection table here that maps and up like many up many ops to um one or more sort of uh, argument encodings that are just labels and so they go down here so so I guess it would be nice to have like a little drawing but you could you could imagine sort of like a, a freeway maybe like a road where you drive in a car, like with a lot of lanes, and then suddenly it sort of, you know, gets narrower, um, and you have to choose if you're gonna go south or north or whatever, right? That's essentially what's happen happens here. We go from a lot of things to just the just the things that matter in this case, which is the argument encoding. So we jump from here down to one of these. This is just a preprocessor macro to help the code not be too messy here. Uh, and we have two formats. We have a format where we know that the um, so again these are these are perfectly correlated, right? Um, so we have a format here that is, for example, a b. We know that uh, the b is names a register and nothing else. If it if it tries to have a number like one two three in the assembly, it will be an error. Uh, and then we have a either then we have sort of like a an a, a variable sort of type of arguments. Um, so it, A here either names the register or it is an unsigned immediate value in the in the A argument. And this is uh, roughly the same. It's either names the register or it is a signed immediate value in the A argument. And then we repeat the same things for argument B, C, and D. Um, and now we start seeing some of these kind of error messages and where the, you know, where the kind of inline analysis goes here. Like we're checking and making sure that we're getting the correct number of arguments. Uh, we're pointing things out and stopping things if that's not correct. Excuse me. Um, for example, we even do things like if you try to give something that only accepts a, a register, if you try to give them the immediate, We'll point that out. That will just jump down here from this thing up here. So you jump down here to print out this error message. It says, you know, the last argument argument must be a register. Uh, and we named the, the operation to make that easier for you to, to spot your error in the code. Um, and then the other piece, so this function is kind of broken up into two functions. Uh, since, since this is called in a bunch of places here, it's a separate chunk of code. So get get i args is like get integer arguments from the ast node and sort of you know put those into um uh into these oh did i make a mistake here oh yeah it should be i64 um let's make sure it's still no it doesn't work now what there i do wrong let's fix this real quick oh Yeah, so our register size is a, is an i64. Should probably make that a typed up somewhere so that it can be changed easily, but that's always not. So this thing called so this this sets up there are up to four arguments, right? A, B, C, and D. Uh, and so what this function does is that it uh, it takes the information from this, right? About um, you know whether we want a uh, let's see here. Uh, the the number of arguments 
the uh, the storage for the arguments to be parsed, so to speak, or in, or checked, and then the uh, the AST node, and this is just some some um, some generator state we're passing around. And this function up here, it's it's it looks really messy, but it's actually pretty simple. So what it does is that it um, it first it first loads the the value so that we have up here. Where is it? This mostly is a check for you know producing error messages. So this just loads the register number. So you know R five or R zero or whatever, right? So like this one. So R one. So we know that for for any instruction encoding that uh, for the for the first arguments of all of these instruction encodings, they're all named registers. They cannot name immediates. Immediates can only be the last um, argument, right? So what we're doing is that we are just checking, making sure that these are populating the arguments for all of the first, um, the head of the arguments. What is the correct name? All but the last. Okay, all but the last. Um, and you know, if we had any any issues, then we jump down to so if we got the the wrong sort of um, um, so number of arguments, we jump down here and we print out some some error message or print out we report it now, uh, and then we print it out in, in our reporter function. And and you know, if we got less than we wanted, we'll say not enough. If we got more than we wanted, we'll say that there were too many, and we point out where it is, and we point out what we got and what we expected and which off that is. So we can just try it out real quick. Um, so X, whatever. Uh, so now we're gonna get here uh, in our factorial function, line six, column eight, too many arguments for the multiplication. One, three, but got four, right? So we get it too few, it'll say not enough arguments, you know? It wants three, but it only got two. So we got this one and that one. And there we go, fix that up. And then this thing, finally, what this function does is the last argument, which could be an immediate. Um, so now again, we're going from, we're not going to the virtual machine sort of uh, instructions, we're going from AST to those instructions, right? So remember that. So now what we're looking at is we're looking at the lost arguments. We winded this up, so arg here is the lost argument. Um, and we're looking at the, the type of that. And uh, actually, let me, let's see. We do a bookmark here, let's clear my bookmarks, go up, enable AST logging. Okay, so now we can look at the, the AST that we're parsing here. So, so it's going to look here if it gets a integer register, like one of these. And then it, it loads this and it, re it reports back to the caller that the last argument is not an immediate. So the last argument is a register. If it gets a name, it, it does the label stuff we were talking about before. It goes and finds the label that is it is named. And uh, if that label, let's not go into the details about the label they're referencing because you know it involves that sort of chicken and the egg thing, but um, but essentially what we get back here is this just looks up the label essentially and gets back the the relative offset. So it's a sign number relative offset to uh, to that label. Um, and if we get uh, and then reports back that it's an immediate, sorry. Um, if we get like a literal, like here, for example, we get the inter integer a decimal literal one, then um, we make sure that it fits, that it wouldn't overflow the value, right? So if we go in here, and if we, you know, enter a really large number here, we should get an error message, this value is too large, right? So that doesn't fit in uh, as an immediate, we would have to use a constant for that. And again, we do the same thing, we just store the arguments and now um, report back to the caller that it was an immediate, and for all other things that are unexpected, you know, then we'll just report that um, we, we got something unexpected there. We point that out and so on.
And something that's kind of neat about like this and the parser we looked at, like with the with the if you remember the the nil node that we used instead of like just uh, you know a null pointer, uh, we use a similar technique here for like for error handling. Um, generally, I think that it's it's better to write parsers and sort of compilers or whatever you call this code generated thing, so that when an error occurs, it can keep going at some sort of sensible state that won't break the program. It might not make any sense to use the results from it, but the program can keep going without sort of being in an undefined or weird state. Um, so that's, you know, as we're parsing things and let's see, what is it called? Nil something, big nil, right? So when we, um, when an error occurs, right? Instead of just like not doing anything or returning null here and sort of having unknown what's going to happen with the caller now, we create this nil node and we just return that and then we report the error. And similarly, oh shoot. Oh, my label stuck, good. Uh, and similarly, what we do here is uh, we, as we assign a value to the argument that we're parsing along with reporting the error so that we can keep going and we can keep getting mess like error messages. And since the last time we looked at this, we were, just, we were just using the log function to just print out errors as they were happening. Now, today I changed that. So as an error occurs, I used that invoke this callback that you pass that you pass on to the assembler. So you pass on this little callback. You can also pass on a some arbitrary like data to yourself that is looped through, which is pretty common. So use the data, whatever. And so this is being evoked. And if we return false here, the whole thing is going to stop. Um, parsing at that place instead of keep going. So that way you can control how many error messages you want if you want to like limit error messages and stuff like that. So if we have, so if we have two errors here and we run this, we're gonna get two reports, right? Too many arguments, too many arguments, and then let's say that we only we want to stop as soon as we get any error. We can just return false, and then the parser will stop right there. And uh, yeah, I think that is that. It, that's a pretty quick sort of summary on on how the code generation works um, and changes since since yesterday. Um, maybe I'll do a more deep dive into uh, what um, sort of uh, <laughs> what might be to to build it this way. I don't know. I'm certainly going to as next steps um, add the ability to just like give a file to this program that we're running here, right? So, you know, we have this, um, so let's look at that. So we have this program that we've been building, right? Which is 403K with all the, with all the instrumentation. Let's just build a non debug build and we can look at that. Um, So 73K, uh, we strip it, it'll be even smaller. 67K, the entire compiler and virtual machine, including our sort of diagnostic messages. Is, I think that's that's uh, that's pretty well done. And we can run it, of course, and you know, we'll, we'll uh, get our little, little up it. Anyhow, so the next step here will be to, to you know, say something like this, factorial, right? You pass it a function or even, um, or even like echo program, you know, or, or whatever, a program and just have that run. So that's gonna be a next step. I, that won't take long. That, that probably only take a few minutes to implement. Um, but still, I'm, I'm pretty happy where this turned out. Um, I'm pretty impressed again, as I was saying earlier in this video that I actually finished this in in the week, um, and reflecting a little bit on the the whole like video stuff, I spend I spend more time, I think uh, maybe at this point it's it's even out, but definitely the first few days I'd spend way more time on the whole like video stuff and getting that working and working around all the quirks and stuff around that, than actually working on the project. Uh, so the project had taken sort of a, a backseat at least time spent. I think at this point it's probably about a 50-50 the time I spent on uh on all video production stuff 
which this is like surprisingly complicated in the year 2022, but that's how it is. Uh, and, and this project. So yeah, it's very satisfying, uh, very satisfying little thing. And we'll see uh, where I'll take it from here. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you uh, soon again.